Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles, and welcome to At Family Office, At Family Office TV, for Old School Podcasters, Angela Robles Podcast on Apple and Spotify. And as always, a special shout out and often direct interaction live on these programs to my members of SFO Continuity. Today, and it's been a couple of months, which in the world of AI is forever, I am covering yet again what I look at and what I've been, I think, on the forefront in the family office world and very active, including writing for my members on the subject, on AI. So the focus today, and really my title can't cover it all because it would take up the full thumbnail, but we're going with AI agents are evolving. We haven't really spoken about AI agents. You're in for an interesting surprise today. But we also cover what super intelligence, which is beyond AGI and inevitable, we could argue the timeline, what that means for family offices and something that I've never really done before. But because things are evolving so quickly in AI, just in the last week, I'm going to bring up various new news events and things happening in the industry with our special guest and get their feedback. So we're very fortunate to have back on. And I know some of you will say, wasn't Dr. Kaplan on a couple of times of the summer? Yes. And he crushed it and did a great job. You have to go back on my platform if you haven't and watch those multi-hour interviews. One of them where we did a deep but intense dive into investment opportunities is off the grid and only for my members of SFO Continuity. In a couple of weeks, we'll probably have Craig back for my members and do an update on that. So again, there is value in joining and being a member of SFO Continuity. But our special guest is yet again, because he's so good at explaining complex topics and like I'm obsessed with single family offices, he's that way, although smarter on AI, and that is Dr. Craig Kaplan, CEO of IQ Company. And what makes him unique to me and from the investing end, effectively retired hedge fund manager on top of it with part of my business interest in Greenwich, Connecticut, although sometimes I kick the hedge fund managers a little bit. How can you not like that? Craig, welcome back. Angelo, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's terrific to be back with you again. Excellent. And I will repeat again for the audience, there's going to be a little bit of crossover to some of the things we did in the summer. But again, that was three or four months ago in the world of AI, exponentially two to 10x other industries. It's going to feel like I haven't spoken or seen Craig in like a year and a half, two or three years, because so much has evolved. And even as I spoke about in the summer, an answer to a question back then may have a different perspective now. Dr. Kaplan, besides being a deep thinker about the subject and obsessed with it, also has went to some of the larger industry programs and events, met with some of the other thought leaders, and has a lot of new updates. So on that note, this is such a great subject. Let's get right to it. I'm going to start a little straightforward, Craig, just to kind of lay the groundwork. So yeah, really, we believe in more of an LM, LL. LLM stage now, large language models. There are some, Elon has hinted that he's kind of not so sure that we're not even a little more advanced than that and arguably in some form of AGI. But if you could describe to the audience a little bit of where we are now with LLMs, the natural advancement to AGI, effectively artificial general intelligence, and although we'll save this one more for later, but inevitable, we could argue timeline, advancements to super intelligence, like one, two, and three, how do they weave through and where do we stand now? Sure. Uh, great question to start things off. So kind of to orient, um, we won't go all the way back to 1956 and the birth of AI, but if we start with- Or that, Ada Lovelace in the 1800s. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and I, yeah, I didn't like forget, Craig. Going, I like going back that far because- I think it's very um, important and sometimes forgotten that it was a woman who invented computer programming, Ada Lovelace, way back when. But if we start with uh, ChatGPT, sort of uh, November um, 2022, right? So that was the release of ChatGPT. That really started everything off. 
Uh, that was when the world sort of became aware, the larger world. Researchers, of course, had been following this for years and working on it. But I think the general public became aware that these things called large language models existed. Uh, so GPT, November 2022, the starting gun. The next step along the journey was to take AI agents, uh, large language models, I should say, and those have a capability that was really trained into them by being exposed to large amounts of data on the internet. So you could take three Library of Congress's worth of information, train these models using machine learning algorithms, and they would have the ability to converse with you or interact with you on pretty much any subject. The next incremental step was to say, okay, we want to add domain-specific expertise on particular subjects. And you saw in probably 2023, I would say was the year of things like RAG. RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. And the idea was you could take a large language model like GPT and you could upload all of your documents or database information about your company uh, or all of your emails. And when you asked it questions, it would now reference those uploaded documents when it answered. So it would have specific information about you or your business and could answer a little more intelligently or with more expertise about a particular domain because you sort of supplemented the general model with this other information. And so that is now pretty commonplace. You can go to places like uh, Google's Gemini AI Studio. And if you want, you can just put in PDF documents and you talk to Gemini and then you say, please respond based on these PDF documents that I've uploaded. And it will start giving you more intelligent answers that are relevant to the particular uh, area that you care about and where you've uploaded information. So we went LLMs, augmented LLMs with things like RAG, uh, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Then the next step, which is really the year, I would say 2024, has been the year of AI agents. And very simply, an AI agent is an AI system like a large language model that now has some level of autonomy where it can actually take actions on your behalf. So instead of just interacting with you or interacting with you with the benefit of these documents that you've uploaded, you can now ask it to do things like schedule meetings for you or compose an email and send the email. Um, whatever you're willing to sort of enable the agent to do, and there's a whole lot of tools uh, which are available um, so that these agents can not only uh, sort of interact with you, but can also sort of act more like a personal assistant or uh, sort of a lower level employee where it actually takes actions on your behalf. And that's been the big uh, thing. In 2023, people were working on it, but it wasn't front and center. 2024, it's front and center. And I think the next evolutionary step is going to be figuring out ways that groups of agents, first of all, improving the agents because they're not very good and we can talk about that, but then figuring out how groups of these agents can work together, sort of the way a, in a family office, you might have a number of people working together on the team. Uh, the individual humans are working together. There's some coordination and exchange of information that's necessary. We need sort of that same level of thing to happen with AI agents. And from there, we get to systems or groups that are even more intelligent than what we have now, AGI, artificial general intelligence, super intelligence, which is sort of as we extend the timeline further into the future. So that's a yeah, quick overview. We'll get, yeah, And we'll get a little more into super intelligence, which it, there's lots to discuss there. And some of it may be incredible. Some of it's scary. Stay tuned. Why don't we stay on AI agents? Because I think those in the wealth and single family and even multifamily office community might have heard of it again this year, but don't really know that much about it. And we're going to bounce around a little bit here. So I may have some of the facts incorrect, and maybe it's even a little bit of a exaggeration along the way. But if I read it correctly, the legendary VC Mark Andreessen in utilizing quote unquote AI agents, and again, I may be leaving out key parts of the story here, basically put in like $50,000 of Bitcoin from, as I understand it, into an AI agent to kind of escape the world and create something that could be profitable. And effectively, two AIs working together created a meme. Let's now we're going in the world of crypto and Web3. I don't want to lose the audience here. Stay with me. And uh, 
why don't we keep away from mentioning the name and some of the nuances? Some of it may not be a little bit appropriate for proper YouTube etiquette, uh, but it's it appears, if I'm hearing this correctly, that technically these two AIs working in coordination as kind of AI agents created a meme coin that has generated a lot of money going into it. Whether you want to come in on that, I'll leave that to you. But the bigger picture question is, will we be seeing lots of entrepreneurs as singular people, one person utilizing AI agents and creating companies? I'm not going to say they're going to become a trillion dollar company, a billion dollar company, but could they create and may this be a utopia short term? to create successful companies with very few people utilizing AI agents? Yes. So I'll answer your big picture question because I think that's the most relevant. And the short answer is yes, absolutely. That is happening right now and it will continue to happen. Um, what used to require uh, an individual and a startup team to get going now can be done with really an individual that has the appropriate skills or maybe contracts those skills. Um, so instead of having a marketing person, you could create AI agents that will do sort of basic level marketing. Um, instead of having customer support, you can have AI agents that will handle the basics of customer support. Instead of having somebody who's dedicated to researching a particular topic, where the competition is, what's changing in your field, you can have AI agents that do those sorts of things. So the level of quality is not quite as good as a good person, I would say right now, but it's getting better literally week by week, month by month. Um, and it's going to be a real game changer in terms of productivity and capability, not only for individual op entrepreneurs who can now do the job that used to require a team, but also for companies that had a marketing department. And maybe there were 15 people there, probably three to five people could do the job of all 15 if those three to five were supplemented by AI agents or conversely keep the full 15 and now you can do three to five times more work, um, get more stuff done with the same amount of effort. And so that is going to be phenomenal in terms of increasing productivity, increase in terms of uh, sort of fostering and enabling entrepreneurs. It's going to be a very exciting time and it's coming very rapidly. I would not say we're quite there. This is the year where everybody's figuring it out and sort of realizing that this is possible. And I think in the next, you know, six to 18 months is when we're going to see it really start getting implemented. From my research into it and utilization and looking to advise and help, especially my members as single family offices, it's a subject we're very, very much on top of. It's a crystal ball question, but nonetheless, is it possible for a singular person to effectively create, why don't we be optimistic? Not a million dollar, not a $10 million, not even a hundred million dollar, theoretically and adding employees over time, but far, far, far less scale than we've seen in the past, effectively create billion dollar companies utilizing this. I think they will be part of billion dollar companies for sure. Um, Humans, uh, it's going to segment out. There's going to be some things that humans are going to remain much better than AI at doing for quite a long time. A lot of those are the human to human interactions. I think clients will want to interact, at least if it's an important client and there's a lot of money at stake, they're going to want to act, interact with another human, I think, for quite a while. On the other hand, any kind of task that requires um, sort of uh, extensive research or lots of data is involved and lots of computation is involved, those are the areas where AI agents and AI in general really shines because humans, we're not that fast at processing lots of data. We have limited memory. We have limited computational speed. And if you can have an AI that can look at a million times more data than you or I could uh, in the same amount of time, that's going to be a competitive advantage. Brad Jacobs, an entrepreneur and billionaire multiple times over, uh, founder in multiple companies that became iconic in big companies. I read his book. I met him years ago. He's kind enough to follow me on LinkedIn. Greatly appreciate it. Basically wrote something to the effect of humans are waning. 
technology and AI is waxing and anything, even a CEO position that relies on historical data, that relies on linear, systematic thinking processes and decision making, how is any human? Maybe now they kind of could, but looking forward six months, a year, or a year and a half, how are humans going to compete unless they're seeing around corners, being creative, the human element? I think it's going to get harder and harder. I think that's right. Um, so creativity, it depends on how you define it, because some people would say composing a limerick or something in on a particular topic uh, that's, you know, 20 lines long or something like that. And, you know, everything rhymes is, is difficult and creative. And yet large language models are already pretty good at that sort of creativity. Um, but we're, when it comes to strategic thinking, out of the box thinking, uh, making connections between, um, areas that people might no normally connect. And especially when it comes to types of thinking that have not already been done, that are not repetitive, that are not sort of well-established in the internet record of human intelligence, that sort of thing is going to still be difficult for AI to do. Uh, maybe a, a shorthand way to think of it is if it's a matter of pattern recognition and repeating a process that has been done many times before, AI is probably going to be pretty good at that. If there isn't much data on how to solve the problem, it doesn't exist out there and it requires brand new thinking, um, and uh, a, something that's not sort of prevalent in the data and it's not a easily recognizable pattern, that's going to be something that humans are going to be still the ones to do it for some time to come. If I could push back a little bit on that, because I think it's going to make certain people in wealth management and the family office world a little bit comfortable. Now, again, the reality of certain things that I talk about, and I've written pretty extensively about the subject, might I be wrong I'm going to be only wrong, not to be arrogant here, on timeline. And by the way, maybe I'm being too conservative and it's going to happen even sooner. So you know that I briefly interviewed and connected offline with Ray Kurzweil, the legendary futurist this summer. That was a lot of fun. If I could push back a little bit, correct, where advancements in LLM, AI agents are cool and going to be impactful, we're trending to AGI, but when it reaches AGI, could I safely say 2026 to maybe early 2029, it is going to have some of the capability of let's go with the words, seeing around corners, thinking out of the box, and inevitably, whether it's one year or 10 years after that, it ain't going to be 100 years when it reaches super intelligence then it's going to be effectively, if I could use the verbiage, smarter than all human brains on earth combined. That may be a little bit of hyperbole, and maybe that doesn't happen for 15 years, but this is inevitable, Craig. I don't, I don't mean to push you, but I think we get complacent in a world of wealth management and family offices. They look at this as not applying to them. They're arguably theoretically right at the moment, but that moment is not going to last forever and it's not going to take 15, 20 years. That's right. So to be clear, um, I think you and I are in an agreement that there will be a time and 20 years is, is definitely within the timeline that I see it probably is earlier than that. When you will have super intelligent AI that is smarter than any individual human and probably smarter than all of us put together because there mm -hmm. will be many more of those AIs than there are humans. Um, so really a lot of this has to do with timeline. So when I say um, pattern recognition and those kinds of things, AI can do that. What I mean is it can do that first. That's what's gonna go first. And what's gonna be relatively longer lasting for humans are the tasks for which there do not exist patterns for the AI to recognize. But will that mean that AI can never do that? No, AI will eventually do that as well. It's just sort of the sequence are going to be certain things will will fall first and other things will fall a little bit later. But I'm in a complete agreement with you that uh, super intelligence will become smarter than any human. And in fact, that's a tremendous opportunity, but also a potential danger. And that's what I'm focused on these days is that and end state all the time. We will definitely get to that.
Uh, so a matter of the inputs, is there enough data out there? Well, that's where synthetic data potentially comes in. That's going to get a little bit into the weeds. We can maybe save that for a bit of a different time. But those of you that think that you're beyond safe, first of all, at the moment, certain positions are, in my opinion, gravely in danger without a doubt within one or three years. And then inevitably, whether it's five years, seven years, 10 years, It'll be a complete dynamic and change in the future, in my opinion, of the world of wealthy families and family offices. Do I obsess a little bit about that too much? Maybe. I've written extensively about it. And I think it does tend to scare people that tend to put their head in the sand in, you know, Angelo might be right, but his timeline, oh, way off, 30, 40 years. Like, no, I am not that far off. And if you listen to Kurzweil, he be he may think that this stuff is like three to six years away. Maybe he's right. Let's, and I know I'm going down a path that isn't necessarily your wheelhouse, staying on AI agents, and you could wrap in the advancements in LLMs. If there's a single family office, like how could a multifamily office, I could get it on the marketing, automating, emails. I think AI agents, maybe closer to six months to a year, are going to be very impactful to small RIAs, to MFOs, and to those looking to start up, even hedge funds. But single family offices are somewhat unique beast. Are there certain aspects of bookkeeping, of certain services where AI and AI agents right now are an optimistic word, enhancements to a family office. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think in some ways the single family office can maybe gain, you know, relative to what they're able to do now, even more than a multifamily office because single family offices tend to be a little bit more resource constrained. Um, and AI really is a force multiplier. It's a, it's an intelligence multiplier. So just right off the bat, I'll give you three things that I think a family office, whether single or multi could use. Uh, AI agents, even at the existing state, which is not nearly as good as it's going to be in 18 months. Um, so one of them is research. So you're doing research, you're following stocks. It's time consuming to really do a good job. And there's tons of data out there on every single company. So imagine if you had an agent where you said, I'm interested in these sectors and these types of stocks. The person who's in charge of the family office gives the list or says, here's some of them and find, I want you to suggest other ones. And this AI agent goes and basically combs the internet and finds all the information and synthesizes it and summarizes it. Large language models are quite good at, at summarizing information. So that's a task that they're already proven they can do. Um, and then there are agents now that will equip these large language models with the ability to search the web or the ability to search various documents. And so they can now do what it, you know, even a year or two ago, you would have had to have an intern or um, sort of a, a lower level research analyst do, but they could do it 10 to 100 times faster and covering much more ground. The amount of uh, the equity universe that you could cover, even as a small single family office, um, is probably what only the really large firms could have done, you know, just a couple of years ago. And so that's one thing you can do. So research. Another one, portfolio construction, right? Portfolio construction is fundamentally a mathematical process, right? It's, uh, you know, you want to maximize risk reward. You want to look at correlations between different um, assets and asset classes that you have in the portfolio. You want to adjust, uh, have diversity, not only in asset class, but also in timeline, right? So some that are, you know, going to have an impact more near term, some that are longer term assets. Uh, you want to have different types of strategies. So all of that is sort of a mathematical process at, at its core. And computers are very good at doing math. And so I see uh, portfolio construction and simulation and comparing different portfolios as being an area where AI could really help quite a lot. And then the third thing is monitoring. So let's say you've now decided upon, you've done your research, you've, you've constructed your portfolios. Now you want to monitor that. You It used to be only the very biggest and best quant funds would be able to, you know, back when I was doing this, at the very top, the top 10 quant funds, 
they bought every data source you could get. They analyzed the news in, in uh, real time and they monitored very closely, you know, thousands of different feeds of information to sort of detect if there was any change on their holdings because they had many billions of dollars uh, at risk and it was cost effective for them to do that. For a single family office, it's not, wasn't cost effective to do that. But now you can have AI agents that are actually monitoring every bit of news, right? Going out, you equip them with search tools and various um, you know, API integration so that they can do that. And uh, instead of relying on sort of human reaction time and human ability to monitor news and to react, you can have AI agents doing that for you. So I, I would say it's not too much of an exaggeration to say a single family office today equipped with agents and um, could, could probably do what only sort of sort of the top quant funds could do, you know, maybe five years ago. Uh, at least in terms of that alone is shocking. Yeah, that I mentioned. I mean, there's other things. Some of those top quant funds have proprietary trading algorithms and certain ways of analyzing the information that might be still give them an edge. But in terms of managing the information, researching the information, constructing the portfolio, those sorts of things, uh, I think this is a real game changer for single family offices. And imagine that this is not going to roll back. Like you said, it's advancing what projected a thousand times more powerful within 10 years. If you just go by Jensen's Wong doubling every 14 months, my math's a little off, but a thousand times even faster than 979. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, throwing in a little bit in there, there may be some areas of incredible entrepreneurship and utopia and opportunity for family offices who relatively the short term, let's call it a couple of years out, but when I'm writing about and talking about advances in AGI into super intelligence, this may get a little weird. It may be where I don't know if your wealth and your assets are going to be safe. I don't care if they're more so if they're liquid assets where you don't have pure title and direct proof, quote unquote, of ownership. Uh, I think things may get very, very intriguing in an exciting, but also a scary way. There are, and I, I'm not as comfortable talking about them openly, but opportunities that I would advise the families that I work with uh, to diversify sovereign and other risk, including some of the risk of super intelligent AI. And by the way, there's no one great answer. It's a collective of thoughts and global impact. And to some degree, we'll see what Elon and others do, the future simply in outer space. Uh, so who knows? But if continuity is what concerns and worries you because it's so hard to build up a substantial amount of money and resources. You'd like that to be a value to your lineage, your family, and more globally, I guess, your community. Uh, so these are important issues that I look to tackle. I know they're a little uncomfortable. Uh, I know there's really no one else in the family office world talking about it for a variety of reasons, but hopefully you're enjoying it. Uh, let's a little bit on that theme, and not to be overly negative, but with the advancements in AI and AI agents, I mean, call centers, really? Like, one kind of why do they still exist in six months to a year? That is absolutely an industry that is going to be impacted. And not to bring an overly negative tone to it, but a lot of those are offshore, think of the Philippines. And is that going to be a very negative impact to people in those countries and communities where that makes up a fair amount of quote unquote attractive income and opportunity? Is that going to go by the wayside? So this is a tricky question and one that comes up frequently, which is sort of more generally, if I were to generalize your, your question there, it's, is AI going to take away jobs or will it create more jobs? Is it, is it a boon or is it a threat type thing? And the reality is it's, it's both. It's definitely represents change. There's going to be change. And whenever there's change, there are certain jobs that are probably no longer going to be cost effective to be done by humans. Uh, and, and then there's new jobs that emerge, um, sort of designing the agents, um, overseeing what they're doing. So instead of being the call center employee, you could be somebody who's sort of the human check on an army of, you know, AI agents that are doing the repetitive tasks. Uh, I've seen examples of some of these systems where you can create these agents and authorize them, you know, depending on 
why somebody's returning something or unhappy. You know, if they say that it's price, then, you know, offer them a disc. I mean, you can build in a lot of the things that a human might do. Again, if there are sort of repetitive processes, especially AI would be good at that. So if you think of call center uh, being a lot of the calls that come in are repetitive and they're about the same kind of thing. You know, I'm not happy with the product. It was too expensive. This did, I didn't get this or, you know, you can kind of categorize the type of things and probably for 80 to 90% of those, it's the standard response that the human does over and over again. And in some sense, that's not best use of a human brain, right? I mean, you're not using their creativity. Job satisfaction can't be, you know, super high if you're saying the same thing over and over again to different people and having to be nice. Uh, an AI agent would be fantastic at that because it will recognize all those patterns and you can give it some parameters and authorize it to take action within those parameters. You can offer a discount up to so, such and such. And then if you run into problems, you can escalate. Um, so I do see that changing. I see call centers being one of the areas that will change, but I also see new opportunities emerging um, and I think this is kind of the same story that we see with any kind of technological disruption. The, the old status quo is disrupted. Some jobs go by the wayside, and yet there's new ones that are created. Um, and overall, being an optimist, I, I actually feel like society will be sort of better off. People will have higher job satisfaction. Uh, there will be more productivity. There will be more wealth for everyone. You know, it's sort of a rising tide that lifts all boats. And hopefully we don't get into a situation where we have you know, uh, inequities being exacerbated, but at a minimum, everyone does better. And I think that's very possible. Well, I mean, we could get in a positivity, a positivity relatively moderately short term with enhancements to GDP with the potential of, I'm making this up a little bit, in nine years, super intelligence solving for fusion energy and the opportunity with energy being effectively free. Yes, I want to be that way too. But I can't help but think of maybe knowing human nature and reality. Uh, and we'll get into all of this a little later in super intelligence, what countries are in the lead, why I think it's going to be hard to put constraints around it, because bad actors are, are not going to give a damn about our quote unquote constraints and how interesting it may get in a variety of different ways. But let's let's build into that a little bit. Uh, I could think of, we heard about this for years, and I guess robo-taxis are a part of it as a kind of an Uber replacement, inevitably, truck drivers. That's been a little slower to evolve than we probably would have thought. And I can make a point, it still could be five or 10 years away, but a truck driver is among the most common professions for a male in the US. There's millions of them, and some of them well into the six figures in terms of what they're paid, including at companies like UPS and others. And no doubt that drones and other forms of technologies coupled with AI is going to have a grave impact, not today, not next year, but not again, I don't think, for this 15 or 20 years out. So this does create grave challenges to governments, to societies. And I just have a hard time envisioning <laughs> with all the challenges we have now in the U.S. and really around the world and all the bifurcation and things relatively a powder keg, what feels like almost ready to explode. <laughs> I really want to make this a positive. It's just, it's just hard. Uh, uh, yeah, some people have said things that require incredible dexterity, a uh, hairdresser's probably safe for decades, an athlete like playing baseball. Yes, but again, give it a long enough timeline, nothing is perfectly safe. But may this open up other opportunities that we're not envisioning, that's the right thing for the industry and people to say. Uh, and it has proven true over other revolutions or industrial revolutions. But this, and I know we all heard this before as well, this is different. And maybe you'll be better, but I'm just saying it'll be interesting. Uh, I could argue this is a positive light that I'll bring up now, but staying with new in the news, like Meta, a company that we'll talk about a little more later, unveiled their movie gen, the most advanced media foundation models to date. And we see so many advancements. Craig, are we at the point, and this is the threat to Hollywood, which is why 
those in Hollywood, was it a couple of months ago, were very concerned about their strike and certain rights. But now we don't need Hollywood to do movies. In theory, myself, I could have a storyline. AI could help adapt it. And maybe it's a little early right now, but let's say we're at the cusp where digital avatar and like actors play out what I wrote, what I'm thinking, and I could adapt the landscape, the voice, the inflictions. I kind of become, we all become, even those with little money, our own producer, director, and the whole dynamics of Netflix, of media as we know it in Hollywood, may be upended really soon. Am I getting too optimistic? Or is this, again, an inevitable reality as well? It's just a timeline question. Well, I think it's already happening. You mentioned Meta came out with uh, Movie Gen. I think it was about six months ago, I remember seeing earlier versions of that technology, probably not quite as good. But ask a large language model to come up with a storyline, give it a general topic like post-apocalyptic science fiction movie. Um, with scientists sort of creating uh, robots. And there's a good robot that's going to save the world. So you give it sort of a general theme, and then you say, write a script, and it'll write a script for you. And then you say, okay, take this script and now turn it into a storyboard, and it will do that. Now take the storyboard and generate the scenes, and it will do that. And literally, um, this was a person who had done this and sort of in the course of a day created like a 20-minute film completely AI-generated, mm-hmm. right, from the, the script, the actors, everything AI generated, the music. And it was not Steven Spielberg by any stretch, but it was a lot better than I would have expected. You know, it wasn't horrible. Uh, And the special effects and everything, you know, it really seemed kind of realistic. So um, this is definitely coming. It just every month literally gets better. I think Zuckerberg is very smart. I mean, he has a lot of reasons to pushes technology and enable content creators, right? Because Reels and the various platforms that he has, this could really help increase uh, sort of uh, the content on those platforms, which he then monetizes. So um, there's multiple ways to come at this. Yes, it's happening. Timeline is happening faster probably than most people realize. And Meta in particular, I think you and I probably both feel like that's a great company for the future because he's very tuned into these trends and he's not just following them he's leading the way which is really good a hundred percent and audience stay with me for a second oh but hollywood has distribution big tech has distribution you're not incorrect but where did people like joe rogan that has 10 million followers charlie d'amelia the tiktok star 80 million plus uh the kardashians like they're Every day, it feels like there's influencers, quote unquote, coming out there, changing the dynamic of information, of disinformation, and a lot of different things. Now, I can make the point this democratize is effectively Hollywood and production. Now, you could be dirt poor. As long as you have the most basic, maybe of a phone and some of these free services, you could create unique content, effectively including kind of your own show in movies. Do you think Hollywood's going to like that? Of course not. Now, I want to be careful not to wear my political hat. This is not a geopolitical discussion, but those industries do tend to skew Hollywood particular to one side of the aisle. And now this creates an opportunity for those with more diverse viewpoints. So being very careful with my words there, everyone, to potentially have an arm of distribution and an audience that they could attract. And it's good. You want to have fair and balance and opportunities from a variety of perspectives. So this is one thing that I don't look at as being a dystopia, Craig. I look at it as being this may be, unlike what I said a couple of minutes ago, create a little bit of unique opportunity for all of us to be the creative, the producer, their director, and who knows what direction this could go. I agree with you. I think um, the source of culture and pretty much all the value that has been created by civilization has been so far up until now human minds and in the future it will be a combination of human minds and artificial intelligences but the more um creativity and ideas 
uh, that can be enabled and empowered, the better off we are sort of as a first principle. There's all kinds of other problems that arise. You know, how does your message get heard with all this noise and filtering out and information overload and uh, special interests and all these kinds of things. But just from first principles, having more ideas, more creativity from which to choose from as a species, as, as a global um, culture, community of humanity, I think is good. Now that may weave its way into, which we won't discuss today, but a creator economy. And that is where the promise of Web3 from a couple of years ago, and again, democratizing the opportunity for a fair and balanced and not a single point of failure and not a single entity that controls it, uh, that creates an interesting dynamic that I look at as being a positive. Whether the system will allow that to happen might be a little bit of another story, but I don't know. You know, what, why don't I be a little optimistic and dream? By the way, my members and those that I selectively invited in as a live participant, you could jump in with questions. Go for it. So we highly encourage interactivity. Uh, someone did send me a text, ask Craig, and this goes back to the impact of AI agents and broadly AI in the family office and wealth management community will, and the answer is obviously yes, but how and maybe when will legal and accounting be disrupted by what's occurring with both quote unquote AI and AI agents? So I would say current state is there's already some pretty good, I, I can speak more maybe to the legal than the accounting because I've seen some of these programs uh, if you take contracts, for example, um, what a lot of um, lawyers do, at least the ones that I've interacted with, is they draft contracts, they review contracts, they make sure there's no gotchas in there, um, and uh, they bill relatively you know, high rates for that service, uh, and they're pretty good at it, if you have good ones. Um, but I saw a demonstration of basically putting like a good human lawyer against an AI agent and just saying, okay, here's 10 contracts, go through them. And, and the contracts deliberately had subtle things in there that were kind of gotchas, right? And measure, did the human catch it? Did the AI catch it? And how fast could they go? And so um, amazingly, and this was even a year ago, so this is, I'm sure the technology has gotten better since. Um, as you might expect, the AI can go through the contract much faster you know, more than 10 times faster and <laughs> probably do a hundred contacts in the time it takes the human to do one. Um, but what was surprising was it, it caught as many of the problems as, as the human did. So, um, the quality was essentially the same and you can argue, well, maybe if there was a more subtle thing that might not have been the case and it's always how you set up the experiment, but I think they did their best to try to, um, have a level playing field and to make it realistic. So, uh, AI agents that can review contracts and can spot problems and can uh, give advice already exist and they're getting better. I think at this point in time, due to legal liability and just the high stakes nature, you still have a human lawyer review it. If you were using this with a real client, you'd want a human lawyer to review it. But it's kind of like doing what a paralegal might do, but much more cost effectively. I would imagine the same thing is true of accounting, although I've not had any firsthand experience with those systems, but it makes sense that that also is happening in those fields. So uh, we're moving rapidly along those uh, in that direction. I think at this point, it's still human oversight. It probably will remain human oversight for some time to come. Uh, but if you just think of how much work is done by paralegals and assistance to CPAs and so forth, uh, there's a lot that can be done by AI sort of at a tiny fraction of the cost, even right now. And I'll go back to what I said earlier in um, putting words in Craig's mouth. I'll admit that. I think his words for some time. He doesn't mean 20 years, everyone. <laughs> maybe it's a year and a half, maybe three years, maybe five, maybe seven, and maybe 10 to 12 for certain. It is not decades off. And Joe, who sent me the text, who I know, appreciate you, my man, but you're wrong. So now you're wondering, well, what the hell is he asking? Basically to the effect of RIAs and MFOs, it's not just about investment management and tax mitigation. Uh, it is effectively the human relationship. I'm going to call a little bit of bullshit on that. I think we hear that too much. 
oh, I'm a wealthy person. I need that human to human relationship. I, no, I don't. I want the best quality service in investing, in legal, and accounting. And I may want it articulated by quote unquote a person, but that's even going to start to change. And I'm not the most technology proficient person in the world. I just feel, and maybe no one's telling you all this, your outdated consultants in the MFO and industry that are self-preserving. They don't know what they, <laughs> they definitely don't know about technology. Why don't I start with that? They do not know. They are bureaucratic up the wazoo and they're telling you what you want to hear. I'm telling you what you don't like, but, and again, I, if I'm wrong, I'm not wrong on strategy and thinking I'm a little off on timeline. Maybe that's debatable. Maybe I'm, I'm too conservative, but to assume that you're so special as a human that you admit that you may not be as good technically as AI advances in a day, a week, a month, a year, but your human relationship is going to save you. Do you think a lot of the young people coming up now that use technology are, are they need that human to human relationship? I mean, maybe they should. There's a lot of problems with them right now. But to assume that you are safe, you're all good, I'm comfortable, my advisors in the wealth management and hedge fund and MFO industry say that I'm safe and we humans need our interaction. No, I'm calling that a complete misrepresentation. You could call me wrong. I don't care. Uh, Craig, I don't mean to throw you in the middle of this little bit of a debate and argument, but I've been doing a lot of debates lately, so it got me a little riled up. You're probably <laughs> going to fall a little bit in the middle, but why don't we get your feedback on it? Okay, sure. You're, that's just what I was thinking. I actually see some points on both sides. So uh, I think, and I haven't seen Joe's comment, by the way, so only what you've said about it. No, it's, it's right on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but Here's an important point, which um, might be part of what Joe and others are um, sort of pointing out, and I think it's very valid. There is a dimension of trust. Trust is very important, um, and trust is also sort of, um, you know, risk transfer. So if I deal with a consultant and they give me advice and the advice is wrong, they're liable for giving me bad advice, right? And also, I'm trusting that person. And sometimes, even if the advice that the consultant is giving me, maybe a very junior person in the organization came up with that idea, I will never know. But the senior partner is telling me with confidence, and I trust that, that senior partner. And there's a certain value that that trust uh, commands. And I think one of the problems with AI right now, and here's where I agree with Angela, I don't think it will remain this way. It's just a matter of timeline. But as AI exists today, this instant, uh, you have large language models that hallucinate and make things up. You have agents that can make mistakes. And so they are not fully trusted. And part of the reason they're not fully trusted is we don't even know completely how they work and we can't predict necessarily that what they will do. And for those reasons, uh, even if a human did nothing else other than behind the scenes use AI but then review it and then put the good housekeeping seal of approval before taking it to the client. There is some value in having that human say, yes, I've reviewed this. You trust me and I'm vouching for it. There's value there. But I think over time that value will diminish as AI gets better and better and as people begin to trust it. It's the same as with self-driving cars, right? In the beginning and even in many cases right now, there's still the human with the steering wheel in case the self-driving car does something wrong. And people almost need that. Even if the car is able to drive better than the person behind the wheel who's supposed to be the safety check, you still are reassured having that person there. But there's a certain point at which the steering wheel goes, the safety driver goes, and you've crossed a threshold where now you just are trusting that car. And that's a certain point at which people have had enough positive experiences and they've seen that these self-driving cars are actually now safer than the average human, that they're actually more comfortable with the self-driving car than they are with the, the taxi driver who doesn't speak English. And I've been in some cabs in New York where they've literally gone down the wrong way on a one-way street. <laughs> and I thought, wow. You know, Welcome I'm, to New York. <laughs> I'm safer uh, with an AI driver than that particular driver. 
So I think that same level will be crossed in many, many fields. Uh, right now, there may be some value having the human vouching for it and uh, from a trust perspective. But I think Angelo is correct. Over time, that will not stay. And if that's what you're banking on, that's probably not the best strategy. Um, the best strategy is to try to um, be ahead of everyone, embrace it, be six months ahead, and you will have that competitive advantage, in my view. It's always better than trying to play catch up. I try to be three years ahead, Craig, but everyone thinks I'm crazy. I'm not so sure they're wrong. Lord knows I'm wrong more than enough times, but occasionally when I'm right, boy, I hit grand slams. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know if you could go a baseball player. Maybe I'm someone who hits a lot of home runs and strikes out a fair amount, but at least I'm in the game. Yeah. No, swinging for the fences. Babe Ruth, right? I uh, left the league in uh, strikeouts, but also home runs. Uh, staying a little bit on kind of in the news. So I believe it's pronounced Amika and Ozzy. Uh, two humanoid robots by Engineered Arts are able to have expressive conversations, chat GPT. So we're just starting to see again, even in just a couple of months, more and more advancements that we're feeling comfortable with. And we'll get to humanoid robots, which appears to have really blown up in the last couple of months. Again, it feels like years, but it's being so accelerated. Like I go into my AI news every day and it's like, I can't keep up with it because I got to have knowledge on more than just AI and the work that I do with family offices, investing, accounting, family governance, philanthropy, sovereign risk, global structures, Bitcoin, gold, uh, et cetera. Like I could go on and on. So I can't, like you, give my life to it. There is so much occurring, which may be staying in the news. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention just about a week or so ago, Elon had his unveiling of the Robo taxi, more update on Optimus or humanoid robot. If you could talk a little bit about what you saw, your opinion of it, and the impact on the company's stock. Sure. So first, a quick comment on keeping up. So I, I am focused on this hundred percent, and I can't keep up. I've heard Eric Schmidt, former chairman of Google, who has pretty much said that he's hundred percent focused on AI and that he can't keep up. So none of us can keep up. The, the pace is so fast. Um, so don't feel bad about that at all. <laughs> it's just the nature of the beast at the moment. The, the rate of change is so fast. In terms of um, Tesla and robo taxis and uh, Elon Musk's efforts in robotics. Uh, well, I mean, he did that unveil of the robo taxis and the stock went down after that. I think that was because people were expecting more details and he might have been a little light on the details and timelines and Wall Street is, you know, sort of merciless when it comes to some of those things. However, my view is the general trajectory is excellent. I mean, we're moving in the direct, right direction. He's moving in the right direction. Um, it's, again, this matter of timing. And, and I know from a Wall Street perspective, timing is very important because many people are trying to make trades for the next quarter or the next few months. Um, my view on that is that that is not necessary. That, that's not a necessary way to uh, make money on AI. It's not the preferred way. I think there's a much safer, much lower risk way to, um, you know, invest in AI, which is to a very simple thesis. So I'm going to diverge a little bit. I'm going to share right now what has made me a lot of money recently and what I think is very underappreciated. So hopefully it's worth the diversion. A lot of people are trying to trade the latest news, the latest press release, the latest unveiling. I think that's a very hard game. I mean, this is from someone, I, I spent 14 years trading every day, in and out of the market every day, billions of dollars worth of trades. Okay. So very short term trading. I did that for 14 years straight. <laughs> so I know that game very, very well. And I can tell you that is a tough. Craig. Yep. Just back. Well, you're back. Sorry. Yeah. We, we, we don't want to miss this great advice. I got my pen ready. <laughs> so, How dare you get off? <laughs> right. So uh, even if it's not trading in and out of a day, if it's trading, you know, over a couple of months, still not the best. What we have here served up on a 
not a silver platter, a golden platter, is a once in a lifetime disruptive transition, technological transition that is going to revolutionize everything. And rather than trying to predict that to the exact month, it's very simple to sort of so much easier and so much more profitable to realize that Wall Street has fundamentally, in my opinion, mispriced the speed, the acceleration of this event, fundamentally mispriced. So if you're willing to take a long time horizon, and even if you're not an AI expert, if you can just identify the two or three sort of very good companies, NVIDIA, Meta, you know, Microsoft, the, the ones that are in the game and are in the game for the long run, the fact that this is a technological disruptive thing, it doesn't happen very often. Wall Street is pricing everything based on historical data. I know they do this because I've talked with all those guys and that's what everybody does. They run back tests and they look at history. This is not in history. It isn't going to be there. So they're going to use the history and they're going to misprice it and say that it's going to take longer than it will take. And if you just take the long view and try not to get too upset with the short-term volatility and you buy quality and you hold it, you are going to do fantastic in my view. And that is what works for me. And it's the exact opposite of what I did for 14 years. So it's not like I have a a priori bias for that approach. But I think at this point in time, it is the easiest way with the lowest risk uh, to profit from AI. And in about three more minutes, I'm going to come back and ask you about several companies. Yes, they are in the Max 7. Some of them we spoke about back in the summer, but we'll give an update as your thesis changed. Because again, in this community, hmm, three or four months might as well be a year or two or more. So you left a good hook there that we're going to come back to in a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, staying a little bit on Elon and Optimus, the robot, humanoid robot, I might add, and not the only one. You have what figure, you have others. China has a couple, and they all appear to be advancing uh, impressively. Now, again, we could debate. It appears like the Optimus via Elon's had some level of human level of control because it was it was like too good. Uh, and he was a little bit mysterious about it, but just the fact that it is progressing and is it going to be able to do what we kind of saw even three months, six months, nine months from now? Probably. So he mentioned price points as being probably maybe starting at 30,000 plus, but working its way down perhaps one day to like 15 or 20,000 in the not too distant future, coupled with capability of maybe allowing our elders to stay in their home more with certain home health care, cooking, walking the dog, yet having the built-in AI, the access to meta, to chat GPT, to the advancements in LLMs and uh, everything that's happening inevitably with AGI, it's going to be all there at our fingertips. Imagine them hologram images, teaching children and grandchildren, showcasing historical figures, having them speak, kind of come to life. This is not 30 or 40 years from now. Admittedly, it's probably not two months from now either, but within the next year, we're going to have such radical advancements. This is going to be, I mean, Elon's words were exactly, by the way, the biggest product ever of any kind. Now you could say he's eating his own cooking. Of course, he's going to say that. If he's half right, this sounds amazing. What do you think? Well, I think that last part that you said is the important point, if it's half right. Uh, so with Elon, so first of all, great respect to Elon. I mean, the man is amazing and a genius and has already you know, done more. If he were to stop and never do anything, you know, more than what he's already done. I mean, you know, he's, he's done the equivalent of hundreds of lifetimes worth of good. So, and, and technological innovation. So I want to put that out first. And in addition to that, every CEO is different in terms of how they manage expectations and so forth. Some CEOs, you know, if they get even a little bit excited, boy, you know, it means when Jensen, when Jensen Wang at NVIDIA says the demand is insane, you know that it's going to be really good because he's not prone to exaggeration. He's not that kind of guy. 
<laughs> when Elon says this is going to be fantastic, you have to discount that a little bit because he is that kind of guy. So you have to sort of have a little bit of a filter. So I just put that out there. Um, in terms of the general trajectory, yes, I think that's right. Uh, it, it's all going in that direction. Um, so yeah, those are be, I guess the comments that come top of mind on, on Elon Musk. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic what he's doing. I guess I'll say one other thing, the way I look at these things, and I think anyone can do this really, uh, it, it helps to have a little bit of knowledge about AI, but not too much. So here's something that might be useful. When I think of Tesla and I say, what are the advantages? What, what, what is the brilliance of Tesla? I mean, you could say, well, it's electric vehicles and all that. I actually think the thing I'm most excited about, uh, the core idea that I'm most excited about with Tesla was the brilliance of saying, I'm going to have all these cars out on the road and each of them is going to have a camera and they're going to be filming the road and sending this data back to Tesla headquarters. And the more people who buy Teslas, the more data I'm going to have. And the more data I have, the better positioned I am to make the AI better. That is the brilliance, the network effect with Tesla, is that the more your product is used, the more data you have, that gives you competitive advantage over everybody else to make the better data. And to understand that, you have to understand that one of the most important things, if not the most important things, thing in making a better AI is having more data and better quality data. That is gold. I mean, people said it. It's like oil. It's like gold. It is. I mean, that's really true. And if you have a loop like that, a network effect where the more people who use your product, the more data comes back, then that can be a real source of competitive advantage. It can be part of the flywheel, as people say, that drives innovation. That same approach that worked with electric vehicles you can see Elon is trying to do with robots. If he could get, he's not there yet, but when, it's really a matter of when, when he gets those robots out, the more robots that are out there in your home and the more interactions they have with people, each robot's gonna radio back its data to headquarters and it's gonna be used to train the robot next generation to be better. And that next generation will be then sent out and update the software and the existing robots and again, he's going to have that network effect. Whoever can get out ahead and get the most product out there who understands how to use the data gathered from the interaction of their product with humans to make the product better, that's going to be very, very valuable and a source, probably in some ways, the primary source of competitive advantage. And he understands that very, very well. And so I am sort of in awe of the brilliance of that uh, you know, business strategy. Indeed. And I promised I would come back to certain companies. Uh, back in the summer, we focused on a multitude of companies, but one of them was, well, what a surprise, NVIDIA. And you had a thesis, which you hinted at a couple of minutes ago, relative to Wall Street being historical with their data and being a little bit behind, but they'll get better. And then the mispriced opportunities won't be there as much. Why don't we get an update from you? We're going to go round robin on a couple of companies, maybe for each company if you want. Keep it a minute, 90 seconds. We'll be relatively fast paced, but we'll start with NVIDIA. All right. So I'll start with full disclosure. NVIDIA is my single biggest position in my personal portfolio. Um, so my money is where my mouth is on this or vice versa. Um, and the reason it's there is, uh, first of all, it's an excellent CEO. I always look for that. Second of all, he has the mother of all technological trends <laughs> behind him as a tailwind. Third of all, he has uh, an extreme competitive advantage because through brilliance or luck, however you want to say it, he's about 10 years. He started about 10 years ahead of most of the competition. They're racing to catch up. And what was his response? Let's take our normal two-year development cycle and let's collapse it to one. We're, we're going to just double our cadence. Instead of coming out with a new chip every two years, we'll come out with one every one year. He just made it even harder for the people to catch up. So then AMD <laughs> has to say, oh, well, we're going to do it every year too. Okay, that's great, but they're coming from way back. So um, yeah, it's very impressive. I think, I mean, there's key man risk. Um, it's a flat organization and um, I don't know enough about his bench of people. So, but you know, he seems in good health and everything. 
Uh, his energy is amazing. I cannot believe his travel schedule and the number of appearances he does. It's, it's truly impressive. He's hardworking. He's got that ethic. He's, yeah, there's so many things to like. So I still think Wall Street is mispricing NVIDIA. I love it when I turn on CNBC or whatever and I get people saying how, oh, this is hyped and it's overblown and it will never do it. That's fantastic for me. <laughs> That's just an opportunity to get more. So I'm sort of maxed out. I'm actually beyond the what is a reasonable, you know, position from a risk point of view and concentration limits. Um, you know, at some point you have to, it's really risk management is the only thing that's limiting me on NVIDIA. So my number one all time favorite pick for now, and I feel still confident of it at least 18 months out. And I just watch every day to see if something material has changed and I haven't seen it yet. Material in a negative way. I'm looking for the bad news and I haven't seen it yet. Today, there was some thing of maybe there's country caps. Rumored that there will be caps on selling chips to other countries like there is already on China. Okay, I mean, that's not going to be great, but it'll affect all the chip makers. And the demand is, you know, the line's around three blocks already for the existing thing. So I don't think it's going to hurt them materially. Um, but I do watch for anything like that that could be a, a negative, and I haven't seen it. <laughs> I mean, of course, there's geopolitical risk with China yeah. invading Taiwan, TSMC, Taiwan. That would definitely be one, you know, God forbid, nuclear war that really expands. Uh, so there's there's systemic risks that are theoretically out there. Nothing is perfect, which before I get to some other companies, I will remind my audience, we're recording this at this given time, literally mid-October in 2024. And it's for engaging a little educational and entertainment purposes when you invest you could lose money. Theoretically, you could lose all your money. You need to understand your risk tolerance, your liquidity needs, your time horizon, and effectively, you need to think for yourself. As conditions change, like Craig said, he's keeping his eyes open. Something may totally flip his thesis. Maybe tomorrow. I don't know. So this is for, for fun. Hopefully, you're enjoying it. At the end of the day, when you invest, do your own diligence. Thank you for uh, saying that, because this is not investment advice. And when I talk about what I'm doing, it may or may not even fit your situation because everyone has different timing. There's lots of consideration. So thank you for saying that, Angela. A hundred percent. Another company with a very well-known, powerful, and very smart CEO that is definitely on the cutting edge. I mentioned them already before. And what they're doing on kind of like an open source level of AI is intriguing. It's different. Uh, and that would be meta. What would be your your current thesis compared to the, to the summer, more uptick, neutral, or down? Um, I would say, so first of all, full disclosure again, meta is my number two largest <laughs> position. <laughs> you're, you're, you're hitting my big ones right now, um, which uh, for my personal portfolio, I would say I've gotten a little bit more bullish on a meta compared to, let's say, six months ago. Here's what I like about Meta. Um, so first of all, you have a founder CEO. Founder CEOs, you know, if they're smart and if they're doing well, is a good thing because they have more ability to have the organization be nimble and to react. Uh, they also really have a lot of investment in the company. So all those things are good. Uh, in Zuckerberg's case, I think his stock votes 10 to one or something like that compared to others. So he truly does have control over that company, um, which could be good or bad. But since he's been doing a good job, in my view, it's it's mostly a positive. Um, he's invested in reality labs, which everyone remembers, metaverse and all that. Wall Street didn't like that too much. Um, he was able to pivot. I thought that showed that he's able to react. But Indeed. actually, I'll tell you, my true opinion is I don't think he was wrong about metaverse. Because, and, and here's what I saw, and I'm not sure if others see this, and it could be wrong. Um, if you invest in virtual reality, whether it's through glasses, which they're doing, or headsets or other forms, um, that is fundamentally a technology that brings humans into the realm of AI. That's what it does. It's a technology that has an interface that brings the human into the virtual world. And what happens when the human's in the virtual world? The AI is watching every single thing that human does. 
it's gathering data like there's no tomorrow, right? And what is the most important thing for powerful AI? We just talked about it. It's data. It's the best invention ever, even though the human may feel like, oh, I'm doing my job and uh, I'm uh, pursuing my own goals using metaverse or virtual reality. On the flip side, that AI is watching everything you're doing. It's learning faster. That's a huge competitive advantage over somebody who doesn't have that technology, right? And has to get data somewhere else. And so AI and metaverse are like this. They go together like this. Now, if it's not the hot, buzzy thing and Wall Street doesn't like it, fine. He's going to de-emphasize it. But it doesn't change the fact that it's a really good way to get data and that these two businesses are very synergistic, in my view. And then the last thing that I really like about Meta and the reason that maybe I've gotten a little bit more bullish is I feel from an AI safety point of view that open source is the way to go. So Meta is opening open sourcing their large language model. It's called Meta. Uh, sorry, it's called Llama, Llama 3.1. They're coming out with new versions. In the beginning, it was GPT was sort of head and shoulders above everybody else. And these open source things were trying to catch up. Now the open source large language models are essentially as good as the closed source ones. That's amazing. And they benefit from this huge developer community, which can give you a network effect where they develop things for the open source model. And you're not going to have that same thing with the closed source uh, model. So I, and it's more democratic and it sort of distributes the power. It makes it so it's not as concentrated in one organization, which from a safety point of view, I think is very important. So I like that he's open sourcing the large language model. I like that he did metaverse, even though Wall Street hates that. And he just is very reactive and adaptive, uh, reactive in the sense of uh, he adjusts based on feedback, but he's definitely forward looking and you know pursuing an agenda. He's looking several years out. Um, so, I mean, those are all the things I like. <laughs> when I see that, I, I just want to buy more. Um, but again, I have to moderate a little bit here. Aha, of course. And I totally agree with you, which is counterintuitive to what most people say relative to meta. Now, yes, a couple of years ago, I was very, very active in that part of the community. And again, the issue, I'm not comparing myself to Zuck, the timing was a little off. Why don't I put it that way? That doesn't mean there were still not incredible opportunities and people that made a lot of money a couple of years ago. And there's no question, again, we're not rolling the clack Fuck, well, I could paint an ugly picture of war that could do a variety of negative things like that, but we'll, I'll try to be a little positive today. Uh, Zuckerberg is correct about these things. In the short term, some gyrations, some mistakes on timeline, sometimes adoption is a little bit unique, and even he doesn't have control over that. Although what, near 2 billion, you know, meta slash Facebook uh, <laughs> signups collectively to Instagram, WhatsApp, and Facebook? Wow, it's like one in every four people on earth or something like that. It's incredible, but maybe a subject for a little bit of a different time. Uh, we kind of hit on Tesla, maybe the short version from your perspective of your kind of thesis on that being part of a portfolio. So Tesla, I as I said, I have great admiration for Elon Musk, his genius and what he's done. Um, purely on a valuation basis, I don't have a big holding in there. I have a couple of shares to watch it, really, is all I have on Tesla. And there I, I differ from, I would say, most people because they're part of the Magnificent Seven. A lot of folks are much more bullish on Tesla. Another one that I put in that same camp is uh, Amazon. I'm not nearly as bullish as most people on Amazon. And it's really just a relative value thing. I say, well, I could put dollars on Meta or NVIDIA, which I think are fantastic, or I could put it on these other companies, Amazon, Tesla, which in my view um, are good and long-term are going to do great, but you know, it's, it's a forced choice. Do I put it here or do I put it there? And one is just more attractive to me. Um, and I don't feel like I, I'm already too concentrated in tech, so I don't get much diversity out of spreading it around there. I don't see a lot of diversity within the, the tech sector. So that's my reasoning on Tesla. But again, it's just personal and it depends on your situation. Um, and, and other very smart people would have a different view and I would respect that. And Google. Now, Google's an interesting company with a massive quote-unquote moat. 
uh, lots of interesting opportunities and certainly a wonderful company, but maybe a little bit late to this game is one thing. And I know you're a big fan of Eric Schmidt, although the talk he gave, I believe it was at Stanford, which I did see was taken down. There's still some renegade versions up there. He he took he took some shots. Now, some people would argue he's a massive consultant to the U.S. government. He may be a little conflicted and maybe a psyop, all, all these sorts of things. But one thing he did say that stuck with people, which may be a cultural thing compared to NVIDIA and Meta, I don't know, you're in that backyard. He basically implied that maybe Google has went a little overboard on going overly woke. He did talk about that maybe way too much remote work and a lot of repetitive people and tasks where there was a little bit of a lack of urgency to get things done. That might have been a wake-up call to them. I think they have made some more positive, let's go with the word improvements. But from you, strictly strictly looking at it from an investing perspective, what would be your, your thesis on that? On Google. So an Alphabet, I guess, more generally. Right. Um, so I like Alphabet, um, I'll, but not as much as the others, and I'll tell you why. Um, so I'll give you the pros and cons in, in my view. Uh, the pros are, as I see it, deep mind, really. Uh, Demis Asabis, uh, that guy's brilliant. <laughs> he just won the Nobel Prize, right, in chemistry. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think he was expecting to win, but, um, you know, he certainly deserved it uh, and has been a real innovator in the AI space. I think the talent that Alphabet has is unsurpassed. So if you think about OpenAI, which everybody knows from GPT, who invented the algorithm that OpenAI is using? You know, transformer algorithms. Who invented that? Google. <laughs> Google invented it. Where did a lot of the brain founders come from? to start OpenAI. Well, they were recruited away from Google. Ilya Sutskever was recruited away from Google. So Google has a tremendous amount of incredible AI talent. And you can't say that AI is something new to them. They've been working on this, you know, more than 10 years. Um, so those are all to the, the good. Um, I think on the negative side, it's not a founder led company. So there's, you bring in someone, uh, Sundar Pichai, he's, he's excellent, but he's kind of having to manage and he tries to sort of keep people happy a little bit. Um, in one, in one sense, uh, what I think is really good for the world, which is their emphasis on responsible AI and being careful about what they release. I really admire that and respect that, but you're competing against other people who don't seem to have the same constraints. And so it slows them down a little bit. Now, I think if they they took a slightly different, anybody really could take a slightly different approach to AI where you could go faster and safer, but most people haven't figured that out yet. And so for most people at this point, being safer means being a little more cautious. And uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. In fact, that's definitely a positive thing for humanity. But for the stock price in Wall Street that's looking at you under a microscope every quarter, I mean, that's going to ding you a little bit. Um Long term, I think they're going to do great. I think they have the talent to do great. I think the world is going to be better off for them mm. taking a safer approach. And I do own it, uh, a significant stake in my own personal portfolio. Um, so, yeah, so the bureaucratic piece and the, it's not a founder and going a little slower, those are the things that cause me not to quite have as much of a position there from a purely monetary perspective. Like the return, in my view, is not going to be quite as high as some of the others. But and I they're promise, going to do fantastic. They're going to do great. I promise everyone, I did not forget about super intelligence. We are going to get to it. Craig is doing very interesting work there. We'll talk a little more about Ilya. So we got we got a fair amount to cover. So staying, maybe one final question relative to the investment theme. Uh, it's safe to say, if you don't mind opening up to us a little bit, Craig, you're rather concentrated. Uh, that the most successful investors ever generally are people that are concentrated. Charlie Munger spoke about, I want to have a intimate number of eggs in my basket, but watch that basket like you do very, very closely. I had a guest on who worked at Bridgewater and basically said, like, why do you really need more than 15 stocks? And off record, we even spoke about like, why do you really need more than six or seven? Now that may be a little extreme. 
Uh, and I'm not saying that you don't want to have cash, treasuries, maybe some privates, real estate, help out some entrepreneurs and be active in angel and venture. It's all cool. But are you an advocate that maybe 40 to 60% of your portfolio should be very concentrated? Wow. That's a tough one. So a couple things. So modern portfolio theory, and as you and your listeners may know, um, sort of the benefit of diversity um, sort of is proportional to the square root of the number of positions. So, you know, if I have 16 positions, take the square root of that, right? And it, I'm going to get a benefit of four. If I only have four positions, take the square root of that. I'm going to get a benefit of two. And so at a certain point, as you add more and more positions, you're not really getting that much more diversity. On the other hand, if you have a very small concentrated portfolio of only two or three names, it's you're probably too concentrated. I mean, you are too concentrated if that's for sure, if that's all your portfolio. Now, if that's like a little pot that's reserved for AI or something like that, then that's maybe a different story. Um, so that's one thing to be aware of. Unless you have huge amounts of money to put to work, you know, once you get above 20 positions, you're getting diminishing returns really uh, by adding more. And you probably don't need to because you don't have so, I mean, the people who need to do that are Bridgewater and, you know, when, when you have, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to invest, you do need to spread that out over many positions or you well, have too it's much, so much money invest. and yeah. not to take a little bit of a hit there, but yeah, boy, their returns have really been good lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. There's just certain dynamics as I think most people in the family office world know. Uh, as you have huge amounts of capital to deploy, every time you take a position, you're moving the market. That's called market impact. And you're, that you're, size, yes. Yeah, you're taking a hit. If you're a small person like me or Angelo, maybe we're, you know, relatively small compared to Bridgewater, you know, we could kind of put our entire net worth into one stock on a given day and we're not going to move the price that much, whereas these guys will move it. Um, and so those are some of the reasons why they really do need to diversify quite a lot. They just have so much to put to work. So that's an advantage of a smaller investor is that you're not forced to do that. Then you're looking at risk management and portfolio construction. And a lot of that is really personal. Um, the main point there is, you know, diversification helps, but it helps less and less as you add more and more positions. Um, and so I am kind of a fan of Charlie Munger, actually. It's interesting you said that, you know, uh, Put your eggs in a small, a, you know, small number of eggs in one basket and watch that basket very carefully. That is the way uh, to make outsized returns. It's hard to make outsized returns without taking concentrated bets. On the other hand, you know, from my time, you know, on Wall Street and running a hedge fund, I know that most, uh, you know, large hedge funds, almost all of them will not take more than a 10% position in any one name. And many of them won't take more than 2%, you know, if they're big. Um, so to advocate taking 40% <laughs> of your portfolio in a single name, boy, you better have a cast iron stomach or really know what you're doing or really be watching that carefully or or maybe have it only be a portion of your portfolio or maybe all of those things, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I would be very hesitant to recommend to anyone when I talk to family members and so forth, I say, look, I tell them what I just told you. I said, I don't know any major hedge fund that has allows you to take a position more than 10%. So if you're trying to do that, I think you need to think about that very carefully. And, you know, to the advocacy of you being very active in public, so not as much in private, you're completely liquid. You know exactly what you own. If you wanted to put hedges and things on it, they're easy to do with those well-known stocks that quote unquote trade so well. And if you just look at the math, the last two years, five years, 10 years, ignoring the fact that you have liquidity and transparency, which is great and maybe makes you feel better, you just been doing really, really good. The reality is most overly active managers, net of fees, that's the big one, especially at two and 20, are just not going to be, I'm going to buy it and kind of go to sleep. Now, not saying you're doing that a little bit like Munger, watching that basket closely because you may be a little bit more concentrated than maybe what the average investor should be in. And perhaps the average investor is better off broadly being S&P, triple Q, 
a broad treasuries market, et cetera. I mean, I get it. But again, I maybe I'm not talking to the average here. Those of you who are family offices, want to be incredible. These are certain decisions that many of you are going to have to make. Uh, one person wrote in, how about, I think it's the symbol for Palantir as an AI play long term. Any opinion, Greg? So I know Palantir um, is a real favorite. It's kind of a Wall Street darling at the moment. And many and it's done fantastic. So, you, you know, hard to argue with success. My personal view on it, and maybe it's, you know, because they do so much uh, business with Department of Defense, which is, you know, from an investment point of view, that might be fantastic because the government's a great customer and tends to, you know, stick with you for a while. From an AI safety point of view, um, it's not my favorite thing. I, I prefer to go if I had a choice from a good, good of humanity. So maybe here's where my uh, investment thesis is not driven solely by return. But, you know, I'd rather support Meta that's going to do open source that I think is the right way to distribute this power, uh, which could be potentially dangerous for all of us to lots of people versus Palantir, which is going to be focused more on Department of Defense, large contracts. But uh, in terms of a pure investment, if you leave that aside uh, and other people may have different opinions about that, which I respect, um, you know, certainly they've done terrifically. I don't hold any in my portfolio at the moment, but um I probably would have made more money if I did. And again, audience, you could go back to my platform at Family Office or at Family Office TV, see some of my prior interviews this summer. And again, one of them was private for my members only, so it's off the grid. But we were pretty public on some of the programs that we did. We did do a deeper dive into investing, including multiple other companies, talking about the periphery of AI as well energy, 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 infrastructure, data centers. And that's where we really went deep for my members, which I'll probably replicate with Craig in the coming weeks. Uh, so, but again, some of that is available just by subscribing to my platforms on YouTube. Again, at Family Office, that is the definitive name for the Family Office community. And no, it's not for sale. Uh, so <laughs> go there or to Family Office TV and hopefully you'll enjoy it. Uh, related a little bit to what you just said and going down a little bit of a different path. Will, and this is like the big government type question, will AI disempower the state or embolden it? Well, um, give me a little more color on what you mean by embolden. Like what would you imagine the state potentially doing? Well, I mean, all these great companies, NVIDIA, Meta, Google, et cetera, but who's to say that as AI progresses to AGI and government thinks that these companies are becoming too big and wants to break them up, and maybe this becomes a level of super intelligence and a national issue, who's to say that it's in the hands of too few people, that as a government, this I think would break about every law, but I don't know the nuances of the constitution inside and out. Uh, would the government potentially look to control it, have access to it, partially take it over? And I would think in China, they're like afraid, I would think, potentially of what AI could do in terms of the populace, which may play a little bit to our advantage, or maybe not, being a quote-unquote free society. So it's meant to be an open-ended question, Craig. I don't want to impart my views relative to your feedback. Uh, the okay. audience wants to hear from you, not from me. All right. No, that that helps. That clarifies. So, um, again, you know, time frame plays into so many things that we're talking about. Uh, I think, you know, let's say over the next five plus years, five, 10 years, uh, there's going to be um, increasing, in my view, if I had to guess, there will be increasing attention and concern by all, all governments um, to um, build up AI capability as a national um, sort of resource. And already you're seeing this, um, and NVIDIA, for example, recognizes this when it goes to Singapore and to lots of different countries and basically makes the pitch that, look, your country's data is your national treasure, and you don't want that going over to Silicon Valley. You want the data centers, the infrastructure, and everything else to be able to train your own large language models on your data 
and to keep all that data within your company because that's a strategic and competitive advantage at the country level. And I think that rationale makes perfect sense over a certain time frame. I think there will be uh, a variety of implications of it. One of them is what we're already seeing, restrictions on shipping chips, for example, to China or to other countries that the U.S. feels like are not allies, um, that may be adversaries, because uh, at the country level, the U.S. would like to you know, stay in the lead. And I think there's no question the U.S. is in the lead at the moment. If you go further, so not five years out, but you go 10, 15, 20 years out, I think it shifts. I think we need to realize that the idea that any one country can control super intelligence, which we may get to, is kind of not really realistic. <laughs> what it's really going to be is it's going to be all human beings versus the technology. And hopefully it's not a versus thing at all, but it's like all human beings have taken certain actions along the line so that when this technology becomes much more powerful and intelligent than all of us put together, which Angelo alluded to at the beginning of this talk, um, that we are in a good situation to prosper and we don't have to fear sort of existential threats. And those kinds of threats, which are long-term, are truly ones that affect every human on the planet. And so when I look at the very long-term, uh, I don't see it one country versus another country. I see it as a matter of all humans doing the right thing in lots of countries so that this technology doesn't get to a place that endangers all of them. Um, and that's what I am most concerned about and most focused on and also mo very optimistic. I'm definitely not one of these doom and gloom people who feel like humans are doomed. I mean, there are people in the AI community who literally believe that and are very vocal about it. I don't think it's true. I think we have a window of opportunity where we can really shift things in a very positive direction, but I don't think we should sit there and do nothing either. I think we need to actually take action and we can and should. Well, Craig, would you say that relative to your comment that someone as prominent as Hinton has been a little bit more on the concern and negative side? And maybe yes. for our audience to have context, please explain who <laughs> Mr. Hinton is. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jeffrey Hinton also just won a Nobel Prize in physics. Yeah, just that. Yeah, just a Nobel Prize. So not only a Nobel Prize, but also the Turing Award. So the Turing Award is the most prestigious award in computer science. And the Nobel Prize is maybe the most prestigious award, you know, in the world. And interestingly, he won it in, in physics, even though uh, it was really for his contributions to AI. And I think there's only one other scientist, to my knowledge, that has won both the Turing Award and a Nobel Prize. And that was my old mentor at Carnegie Mellon, Herb Simon. So now there's two people who've done it. And there's only one living person because Herb is passed away in 2001. So Jeff Hinton is now, in some sense, the most distinguished and um, you know, credentialed computer scientist and AI expert out there in the world. So a little more about Jeff Hinton. Back in the 80s, he, along with some colleagues, essentially invented the algorithm called backpropagation of error, um, which is the foundation upon which all machine learning, all modern machine learning is built. So ChatGPT and Llama and Claude and all these large language models and everything that today, more recently, people are saying, oh, this is AI, that all rests on this pioneering work that Jeff Hinton and some other colleagues did um, back then. And it was a way of being able to just, you know, push lots of data at an algorithm and without understanding or programming explicitly how the AI was supposed to learn this, it would just use this algorithm and it would automatically learn things. And back in the 80s, Computers were too slow for this to learn much other than how to recognize the letter A or something like that. But then as Moore's law and, and um, Wang's law has increased and doubled computing power very, very rapidly year after year, uh, now all of a sudden, essentially, those same algorithms, even those ones that were developed way back in the 80s, are now capable of powering these incredibly powerful AIs. And of course, the algorithms have gotten even better. Okay, so that's Jeff Hinton. So Jeff Hinton used to work at Google as well as being a professor at University of Toronto. And he left Google shortly after GP was released. And he left not because he didn't like Google. He 
actually has high respect for Google and responsible AI and what they're doing, but he wanted to be able to speak his mind completely freely and without any kind of fiduciary worrying about what he might do to Google stock or something like that. And what he said was, look, when I was doing this pioneering work, I thought super intelligence, AGI, these very advanced forms of AI, they were maybe a hundred years in the future. And what he realized is his, sh his thinking had changed after GPT and seeing how capable these models were. And he now thinks it's going to happen much sooner, maybe 10 years or 20 years. And he thinks that the power is so great. And this is from the guy who invented the technology, right? There's no more credible source on the planet. And this is the guy saying, we need to be worried about this. He says it's a potential existential threat. And when people ask him, what is the solution? He says, we don't know. I don't have the solution. I only know that we need to invest. And hopefully the younger scientists will come up with a solution. But we need to invest now for them to figure that out because this is a real risk. This is not made up. This is something that he felt so strongly about that he gave up a very lucrative position at Google in order to be able to speak his mind on it. And I think he takes it very personally because he invented the technology and the last thing you want to do is invent a technology that somehow goes bad and ends up killing everybody, right? I mean, that would be horrible. So he does not want that to be his legacy. He wants it to be a positive force. I think odds are it will be a positive force, sort of the informal consensus. If you talk to leading AI researchers like Jeff Hinton and others, I don't know if this is good or bad, but it's like 80% chance AI makes the world more prosperous and is wonderful. And it's like 20% chance that kills us all. But the, the fact killing us all is so bad that even a 20% chance of that is, is way too high. And so things need to be done and can be done to address that. And we have some time to do it. And Hinton's out there sounding the alarm and letting people know that even though he was the guy who invented this and is in favor of it and sees all the wonderful potential, we still need to address the downside. And that for a guy like that that's won the Turing Prize and a Nobel Prize to say it, I think everybody needs to listen, even though it's a hard message to hear. Craig, if you could define for those that are unclear, what is super intelligence? Okay. We talked about the sort of trajectory where we have AI agents and, you know, they're not quite as good as an assistant or anything. Uh, sort of the next little stop on this theoretical roadmap is artificial general intelligence, which you could define as an AI that can do any cognitive task. So any kind of thinking as well as the average human. So anything an average human could do, this AI could do. And some people say we're close to that. Some people say it will take a little bit longer. Super intelligence is when an AI system can do better, can outperform the very best human. So we have right now, actually, forms of narrow super intelligence in very yes. limited, narrow domains, like chess. Already, Magnus Carlsen, the world's top chess player, possibly the greatest chess player that's ever lived, cannot compete at all <laughs> with the best chess computer. I mean, he has no chance. And the same with the game of Go. And self-driving cars, we're not quite there yet, but eventually we'll get to the best race car driver will probably not be as good as the best self-driving car. We're still a little ways away from that. So you can see in domain by domain, the AIs can eventually uh, supersede humans and become super intelligent in those domains. When we say super intelligence, generally, just the word super intelligence, usually what people mean is super intelligent AGI. In other words, an AI that can do anything humans can do better, not as well as the average human, but no matter what thing you pick, the AI is better. And that's kind of comes after AGI. Once you have that general intelligence, these machines already can, to a limited extent, self-improve. So you can imagine something that's smarter Angelo, smarter than me, smarter than you. And then it devotes its energy. It never eats. It never sleeps. Just works 24-7. You and I are stuck with these brains the size of a Nerf football to fit inside our head. And we can only hold so much. These can have a brain the size of a city. It never sleeps. It's already as smart as us. And it puts a lot of its energy on improving itself. It will not take long before that kind of system will become a thousand times smarter, a million times smarter than us. And at that point, we now have to ask, does it have the same values as us? Are the goals and values of this intelligence compatible with human 
values and goals? Are they aligned with human values and goals? And this is what's known as the alignment problem. And I think there are ways to design that system before it gets that smart to maximize alignment. And that's kind of sort of the challenge over the next five years or something. And we shall get into that and what you're doing, but let's dive deeper into the advent to superintelligence, which yes, there are some people that say decades, 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 and decades, even Hinton himself felt not that long ago, maybe even a hundred years. Those right. have all been condensed. Maybe 2029 is a little soon, although there are some people that say that, and maybe more realistically sometime in the 2030s or a little beyond. It appears unless nuclear war or some big disaster to effectively be inevitable. So, and not in a super long time frame. So such an, yes. such an entity would possess strategic thinking so far beyond our own, we can't even really fathom it. It is going to be able to influence quote unquote outcomes in economics, which will impact investing, politics, science, technology, fusion energy. Now, some of that could be very, very, very good. But these things could, I, again, I mentioned politics. I mentioned economies. I mentioned, I didn't, I didn't mention uh, biotechnologies from a negative perspective. Could one drop of something in the water kill millions of people in the air that we breathe? Could it change our dynamic to reproduce children? There's so many negatives that I could point to. Military advantages with drones and technology changing the impact of the world. These are all things that are on the table potentially in the next 10 years. How could I be optimistic through that? Okay. It's an interesting question. Um, I thought a lot about this. So... At a high level, you can think of technology as an amplifier, right? It amplifies human capabilities and it amplifies human values. So if a, if humans have generally positive values and you, you know, all they have is a, a lever or a stick, you know, there's a limited amount of things they can do with that. But if they have a steam shovel, there's a lot more they can do with that. If they have nuclear energy, there's a lot more they can do with that. Uh, and if you have AI, and let's wave our hands for a minute and imagine that we can design this AI so that even when it becomes smarter than us, it still has human values, then it can really amplify those positive human values in a good way. So then we get to the question. A lot of people say, yeah, but what about bad actors and our human? Yeah, that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's a logical one. Um, are humans good or are they bad? You know, And people have been arguing about this for thousands of years. But I would point out to that, I take a very scientific approach to it. If you have a system that watches, Angela, watches you and watches me 24-7, because maybe we're in virtual reality or there's cameras everywhere, but it basically is observing what we're doing. Um, I think it would find that 99.9% .9 of the actions that you and I take are pro-social like objective, because most of them are small. You know, we buy a latte, we say thank you, we say good morning, we, you know, we, you let the guy turn in front of you. Sometimes you cut him off if you're angry and you're driving, but most of the time we're pretty nice. So on a empirical basis where you simply look at every action and you analyze it, was it positive, was it negative? Most of them would be positive. There's gonna be some that are negative. Just like if you think about all the horrible things going on in the world, world, right? You know, thousands of people dying in the Middle East, um, in Ukraine, you know, but if you were to count up statistics, all those deaths as a percentage of the population were, you know, less than one tenth of 1%. That means that on a day in day out basis, 99.9% .9 of what people are doing is not murdering people and not killing people and not fighting. And we are so outraged by those things because they are rare, but they are so abhorrent to us. That's also a good sign. If we weren't outraged, we would be in real trouble. But the fact that we actually are outraged over something that is a very small, affecting a small percentage of the population is a very good sign. Okay. So if you have an AI system, and remember how these systems learn, they learn by looking at data and looking for patterns. That's the fundamental thing they do. 
if they were to get accurate data from their cameras and everything else about what humans are doing day in and day out, the inevitable scientific conclusion is that 99.9% or somewhere around there of all human behavior is pro-social. And every now and then there's these horrible things that humans do to each other. And usually there's a tremendous backlash where people really think that this is bad. And if it learned from that, it would learn, don't do the bad things, do the good things, right? So that's my fundamental reason for being optimistic is science, that if you look at the base rate of behavior, and I know it gets distorted by social media and these other things, which are primarily because humans are evolutionarily evolved to pay attention to negative things. So we watch more ads and we spend more time on the YouTube if there's negative things there. But um, most of human behavior is not negative. It's mostly boring and neutral to good. And if the AI actually pays attention to the actual data, that's what it will learn. Then there will be bad actors and there's other ways to design the system so that positive systems can keep the other ones in check and we could get into that. Um, but fundamentally, if humans were horrible and that was the prevalent behavior for most of our behavior, I think we would not have a chance. In fact, we wouldn't be here today because we would have already self-destructed. But if it, as long as AI is sort of empirical and pays attention to the actual behavior that's happening and the actual condemnation that the vast majority of people have when there are really horrible things, I think that's a good basis. Now you just have to design the system correctly to pay attention to that and not get misled by bad actors or by paying attention to just negative news events and so forth. Interesting thoughts and more of a positive perspective. Some I believe I would agree with and some not. Uh, not to give a history lesson, many of you know more than me and about evolutionary biology, psychology, et cetera. But just go back, I mean, 500 years, yeah, but a thousand years ago, do you know the percentage of women that died during childbirth, of children that didn't make it to the first hour, the first day, the first week. It is shocking, shocking. Like it's a little scary how brave our ancestors were to for human survival. No air condition, no heat. How are you going to get food? Where's running water? Tribes attacking and killing. Uh, one cut could potentially kill you with bacterial infection. The issue I mentioned, like how like women being so just incredibly brave in the example that I gave, a 30% chance of dying during childbirth, like that's like, wow. So yes, things have adapted in a positive way. Could I believe, and I don't have the statistics, that 99% plus of people are inherently good? No, I don't think it's that high. I think most people will stay in line and be relatively good. But it could be a tipping point from a variety of different perspectives. We saw it during the rise of Nazi Germany. Many people are followers. So they're not leaders. They're not independent thinkers. This is just a reality of how it is. Comparative to a thousand years ago, relative per population, Yes, we may exaggerate our condition now compared to back then. We didn't have a nuclear weapon, too, that could destroy the Earth with global nuclear war. Eh, I couldn't mention solar flares and things like that, but uh, let's not scare the audience too much, Craig. Uh, this relates a little bit. Why don't we segue into Ilya Sutzgauer relative to being a truly intellectual deep thinker, his breakup from OpenAI, and leading down the road of trying to grasp super intelligence, being careful guardrails and doing good. And then we'll get to shortly what you're doing. Okay. So Ilya Sutskever, um, I think a very positive story, at least as I understand it. Um, so again, he was recruited by Elon Musk and others when OpenAI was first founded. OpenAI was founded originally as a nonprofit. And their mission was really to develop AI and give it to the world. And the thinking behind OpenAI was, at the time, was that Google was too powerful. You know, it was the leader in AI. As I mentioned, they invented the algorithms that everybody else is using. And um, there was concern that any one technology, even Google with the motto of don't be evil, if you remember way back when, that was their motto when they were uh, went public. Um, even a company like that with this great motto uh, it was too much concentration of power. And so therefore there should be a nonprofit that was sort of focused on the good for humanity 
and would take this incredibly powerful technology that could be used for good or evil and um, would make sure that it was going to benefit the world. That was what OpenAI was founded on. And you had a number of um, brilliant people that went over, Ilya being one of them, worked hard. But then over time, as sometimes happens, um, its mission seemed to be, I don't know if this is too strong a word, it. it sort of, they, they took money. And then when you take money from, you know, venture firms and from uh, partners, then those partners have a profit motive. So this pure nonprofit kind of approach begins to get tainted a little bit. And finally, by the time they were done, almost all of the original founders, except Sam Altman, have left because they were concerned that our mission has changed. And uh, now it took a lot of money and is in the process of converting itself into a for-profit. So it's really sort of a metamorphosis from the ultimate you know, open for the good of society kind of mission to more closed and we're going to be a profit-making organization like everybody else. So that's kind of the background as I see it of open AI. And I can talk about Ilya, but I'll let you jump in if you had a comment there. No, uh, or maybe follow up that they also had another significant person leave very recently. I'm forgetting her name. I'm sorry. Amira. Right. Yeah. Was the CEO. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's certainly very significant. Nonetheless, we won't focus on open AI, but the concept of superintelligence and threats before we progress into maybe what we believe that Ilya is doing and ideas and the incredible work is you as an inventor, patents and a variety of things are doing could help address some of these issues. I do have to bring up, I'm going to press you a little bit on what we went back and forth on about five or 10 minutes ago, let's go with the word bad actors. Now, admittingly, maybe I'm biased here in the US. Uh, I could mention China, North Korea, Iran. I could go probably on and on. I mean, let's just be honest. You're telling me that we're gonna have safety and guardrails and doing the right thing, which sounds good. And they're also, because 99% of their people are good, even if you're right about that and 1% is bad, I don't know. It seems like the 1% has a lot of influence and is in power. Therefore, it just takes one, assuming that person has influence and power to say, ooh, we don't have these guardrails. Let's develop all this energy. Let's progress in AI. Let's catch up. Let's steal the intellectual value of what U.S. companies are doing. Meta's is open source anyway. Let's just utilize it. And suppose they develop bioweapons and other things, and even just disrupting our financial markets that apparently, or COVID-like quote-unquote weapons, like we went through a couple of years ago. Just how could good, without conquering <laughs> counteract that like I, I i just don't see it what am i missing intellectually where let's even say that you're right one percent are bad actors but they're an influence they're looking to do bad things they have no guardrails how is our good going to counteract that they could damage our water our ear perhaps very easily. And you could argue, well, with the press of a button, we do the same thing. Well, great. Then it's just another version of nuclear war. What, what's going to stop this? These are all good questions. And there's probably not simple answers. I'll give you my best thinking on this so far. So I start from a few things. Uh, first is um, the drive for survival is very strong. <laughs> it's kept humanity going for many thousands and even millions of years, right? And so even if you're a bad actor, typically you're not suicidal. I mean, there can be some, but typically um, you may want power and you may want to assert your will and you may want to dominate the other people and get more resources and so forth, but you don't typically want to blow up everybody, including yourself and your family and your loved ones and all those things. So that might happen accidentally, but usually that isn't the, the stated goal. The stated goal is to increase your competitive power or position, but not to destroy everyone. Um, and so even for societies that have very different political systems or different religious beliefs, 
yes, there are examples where people will be suicide bombers and so forth, but it's not like the entire group is going to do that. And destroying the entire planet is, I think, not anybody's goal. So that's one thing. So what that says is um, there can be bad actors, but a bad actor is different than a, a suicidal maniac that is trying to take everybody out, which is, I think, very rare. The second thing um, is how you design the system is very important. So I'm just going to give one example to give you the flavor that I think might resonate because I understand um, you're very active in the cryptocurrency community and some of the audience may be familiar with principles of cryptocurrency. So if you think about Bitcoin for a minute, Bitcoin has hundreds of billions of dollars worth of uh, Bitcoin at stake, right? I mean, if you had a bad actor, all that bad actor would have to do, and this is what's known as a 51% attack, right? If they could somehow co-opt 51% of the computing power that was checking the ledger that says which Bitcoins belong to which people, uh, that entire system is a community system, and it relies on the fact that you have lots of independent people validating. But there's a vulnerability known as the 51% attack where if some bad actor could co-opt 51% of the computing power, they could essentially rewrite the ledger and they'd be in the majority. So their opinion would be the official record. And now all that Bitcoin could be sent to one account, the account of the bad actor. And the incentive for doing that is quite high, hundreds of billions of dollars to do that. And yet... Although the jury's still out, Bitcoin hasn't been around for hundreds of years, maybe just a decade or so. But so far, that's never happened um, because you have the community that, by and large, is positive and trying to work together and because you have to get a certain threshold. So essentially, what you have with Bitcoin is you have the good community members sort of serving as checks on the bad actors. It's not that there aren't bad actors. It may not even be 1%. Maybe there's 20% or 30% of the people that would love to have all the Bitcoin. But there's enough that say, no, we're not going to do that to keep them in check. And the balance of power there is the balance of computing power, which is why this is interesting. So now, as an analogy, and I'm going to do some hand-waving because we don't have time to go into a detailed design, but I will say there are detailed designs. Detailed designs for super intelligence exist that have that same feature as Bitcoin, where you have multiple intelligent entities. They can be AI entities. They could be super intelligent entities that are a thousand times smarter than me or you or any human. And as long as the majority of the computing power, the majority of the intelligence on that network is positive, just as with the Bitcoin situation, they can serve as a check on the other malevolent entities on the network and prevent the bad actions from happening. So you, you've got supercomputers keeping other supercomputers in check. Now, if you ever get a situation where more than half of those supercomputers are malevolent or selfish or want to go down a path, we may be in trouble. But as long as you can have the balance of power in a system that's properly designed with checks and balances, uh, that is one way uh, that we might ensure um, a stable system that is generally positive. And then, of course, we there's a whole lot of questions here, like what are the values of the different super intelligences and so forth. But there's other ways to design those to maximize the chances that they're aligned with human values in general. So I don't want to be naive and say there's no bad actors. And I would say all of us have good and bad tendencies. And I think it's probably the bad is more than 1%. <laughs> it's probably a lot higher than that. But I don't know that it's more than... 51%. I don't think it's 51%. <laughs> and as long as we can keep it at 49 or less, there are designs that can keep service checks and balances, even when those systems are operating thousands of times faster than you and I can keep up. That's what's amazing, is that it's possible to design that. I mean, I'm not so sure that it's not going to take that surveillance of what others are doing. And if it looks to be going down a bad path, effectively, I'm try to be very careful with my words, make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, but inevitably, 
does one get through? And I do not want to make it a Bitcoin conversation, but the 50, <laughs> but the 51% attack there, there, and now we're talking about decentralization, which is an advantage and how that could apply into AI. But there are certain strategies relative to miners and others to see what's going on, stop it, develop. And I think it's another chain, look at past history, transfer over to a new name, but boy, are we getting, now we're getting hyper into the weeds. But what I will say, there are people in the Bitcoin community that are very, very smart that have thought about that. And I'm not saying the solution would be perfect, but there is a kind of a solution if something like that were to happen. And maybe that will transpose its way into even from the AI and super intelligence. As we take it to the home stretch, and I'm going to ask Craig in terms of what he's doing now and how many of you could learn more, I will, one, I hope you're enjoying this conversation. For those of you in the family office community, it's probably more long form, a little intense than maybe you expected, but hopefully you're enjoying it. I know the things that I'm talking about are somewhat uncomfortable and I gave examples earlier where the industry just wants to have their head in their sand and not really understand what's going on. That is the wrong approach from a variety of different perspectives. If you enjoy the intellectual aspect of the conversation, ignore my all black outfit. <laughs> like, like, like one of you commented, like Angelo, you're wearing like lately all black or all gray. Like it, 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 it's a bit of a coincidence, but if you're really liking it, maybe I'll start to do it more. It's more convenient, a little bit like Steve Jobs doing the black turtleneck. I simplify my wardrobe so I don't have to waste brain power thinking about it every day. Boy, the things that people think about. But if you're enjoying the deeper level of conversation, and again, it's not about being like, it's not about whether you agree with me. I've been saying over and over, the industry is behind the times. It's very boring. It's very vanilla. No one is challenging status quo. There's not enough future forward thinking, which again, I might be wrong on certain things. I'm not denying that. I would argue I'm not really. It's just a timeline issue. But go to AngeloRobles.com, learn more, become a member of my SFO continuity, be part of the inner sanctum and circle that gets opportunities for the private access to people like Craig me, peers, and others to think through these systemic risk and challenges. I'm doing a huge project in the coming months on counterparty risk, which is scary from a family office perspective. And cybersecurity and some of the AI issues we're talking about now somewhat interplay with that. So again, I'm trying to be ahead of the curve. I'm doing things I don't think others are doing. Sometimes I break shit when I do that. Uh, but if you want to be a part of this, if you're seeing value in it, it's very easy. The free stuff is just the free stuff. The real deep stuff, you got to go to AngeloRobles.com and join and be a member. Craig, I'm going to give it to you. Talk a little bit about your initiatives, what you're doing, and how people or perhaps larger companies or entities could learn more relative to super intelligence safeguards and other things that you're working on. Sure. No, I appreciate that. And I do think uh, much better to be ahead of the curve and racing to be ahead of the curve than to, you know, allow it to pass you by and try to catch up. So in that respect, I'm a hundred percent in agreement with everything you just said. And if I was a family office and even as an individual investor, I, it's there's never been anything moving as fast as this. So if there's one technology to try to, you know, be ahead of the curve on this is <laughs> um, in terms of super intelligence, I'm going to try to explain at a high level two approaches, the current dominant approach and a new approach um, that is democratic and safer. So the current approach to super intelligence is to take the same thing that we do to build a large language model and do more of it. So the amazing thing that people have realized and the real and the reason that companies like Meta and Nvidia and so forth are doing so well is that uh, the science shows if you take a bunch of GPUs and a bunch of data, you train a large language model using the GPUs, which Nvidia makes using the data, uh, you get intelligence, pretty you know some level of intelligence out the other end. And the more GPUs you have and the more data you have, the smarter that large language model that comes out the other end becomes. And they measure this in terms of 
you know, billions of parameters. Parameter, think of it as a brain cell. So there's 500 billion parameter models that have like 500 billion brain cells. Um, but now there's becoming trillion parameter models. And then there's going to be 10 trillion parameter models. And to get more brain cells into your large language model, you need more data and you need more GPUs. And that means you build bigger data centers and faster GPUs and more of them. And you find more and more data and you try to get the best quality data you can. We talked about how Elon Musk is doing that on some of his companies and you just train it up. And the, the standard thinking is if we keep doing this, and it keeps progressing as it is, and it's almost a straight line on a log log. It's, it's a log function, but uh, so it's not like you, you get a linear increase in intelligence, but you have to put in sort of exponentially more <laughs> GPUs and power. But um, the thinking is if we just keep doing this, super intelligence will emerge. There will be a day when we have AGI, which might be pretty soon. And by 2029, if you're Ray Kurzweil or something like that, just follow that line out and you will have super intelligence where the AI is smarter than any human or any combination of humans. So that's one approach to super intelligence. But it's not particularly safe, which is my main beef with it. Um, the problem with it is that the large language models we have right now are already opaque. They're black boxes and they're unpredictable. Because we don't know exactly what the large language model is learning or how it's representing its knowledge, it's impossible to predict how it will behave. So it's kind of like building a car that you're letting it self-assemble and you don't know if it's going to be have brakes or if it's going to be safe or whatever. It's a crazy way. From an engineering point of view, you would never design anything like that. You would always have a design that you knew was going to be safe and then you would test it. But that's not what we do because people don't know how to design it another way. This is the easy way. Just throw more GPUs, more data, and it'll be smarter, but we won't know what it will do. So then how do they deal with that? After the fact, they try to test safety in. Before they release it to the public, they ask it all kinds of questions. How do I design a nuclear, bio, a nuclear bomb or a bioweapon? And if the thing tells you how to do it, you say, bad model. Don't tell people that. You're not allowed to. Oh, and it says, oh, okay, now I learned that. I won't tell people that. And it's like whack-a-mole. You try to think of all the bad things you can ask the AI, and each time it accidentally tells you a bad thing, you whack it. And that's called reinforcement learning with human feedback. The human feedback is the whacking, and the reinforcement learning, just like a child or a, a pet or something, you're saying, bad, don't do that, and it doesn't do it anymore. So it's a really bad way to try to get AI safety, but that's what people are doing. And then the other thing you do is guardrails. You say, well, just don't answer any question that sort of crosses this line. And you try to put draw these lines for not to answer questions. So you really haven't designed the system to be safe. You really don't know how the system works. It's not trustworthy. It can make things up. You just know it's getting smarter and smarter and more and more unpredictable as it goes. And that's the current path that most people are on to get to super intelligence. So now here's a different way. A different way is to say, we are going to have a lot of large language models, a lot of AI agents, each of which is not that smart on its own. They're just the ones that exist today. And we're going to have them work together in a network. And it's not the individual large language model that's super intelligent and a thousand times smarter than me or Angelo. It's the collection of them. It's an aggregate. The collective intelligence is smarter than any individual. And this is safer. Why is it safer? Because even though we don't know how each individual agent may act, we can see when they work together in a group, if you gave them a certain architecture to communicate with each other, we can see the messages they send to each other. We can see what each one says. Just like in a society, Angelo doesn't have to look into my brain to know what I'm thinking. Is Craig a good person? Is he having bad thoughts? It doesn't really matter. I can think what I think. What matters is what I do in society. And there's rules and there's laws. And if I start doing bad things, it's apparent, it's observable. And it's the structure of the society, the structure of the rules that makes us all safe. So each of us, we don't need Big Brother where it looks inside your head. Um, we just need a society of free agents and we have a, a set of laws that sort of regulates our behavior. And by the way, we could write down everything that everybody does and we could audit it and see if there were unsafe things going on and that sort of thing. Same with AIs. If you have the AI agents, if your approach to building super intelligence is to have a group 
And if everything the individual within the group does is transparent and audible, even if they're individually black boxes together, they are not a black box. All of a sudden you can design the rules and so forth to make the collection much more safe and predictable. And you can get that higher level of intelligence much more cost effectively than the other approach. So this is basically what I've been working at, um, 1800 plus pages of patents describing these designs. They are freely available and uh, papers. And really what I'm trying to do is put out a design, which may or may not be the best. It's one that 40 years in the field, you know, that is a good start. But I'm also trying to just uh, really communicate the importance of designing the system to be safe. You have to design it to be safe. Even if it's not my design, if it's somebody else's design, we need a lot of energy, just like Jeff Hinton's saying, putting, focusing on the problem of designing it to be safe from the beginning, not trying to test in the safety after the fact. And that's, I think if we do that, and in particular, if you adopt some version of what I'm advocating, which is very democratic, because each of those AI agents, one of them could be trained by Angelo and have his ethics and values. One of them could be trained by me and have my ethics and values. When I say trained by us, in the future, it'll be pressing a button and all of our social media profiles and every video we've ever done and everything we've ever written will be used and it will customize that agent to reflect our own knowledge and our own value system. And if we do that with not just one or two people, but millions of people, you can have a very large community that reflects a diverse and representative set of human values and expertise with every agent's behavior being transparent. And that is an example of a much safer approach. And that's why it connects with the Bitcoin and 51% attack and so forth, because some of those actors will be bad. But if the majority of them on the network aren't, they can serve as checks and balances on the bad actors. So it's a, a little bit of a complicated idea, but that's the high level. And uh, if you want to learn more about it, superintelligence.com. Uh, is the website that I have that has more information and videos and some of the interviews that Angelo and I have done together. Actually, it points back to Angelo's site, I think. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to try to communicate and get this word out here. Very cool. And wow, look, I, I forgot about that. Craig is the owner of that great URL, SWATSuperintelligence.com. Yes, it's... Um, Back in 2006. So we've been working on this a long time. <laughs> you sure have. And yeah, this was a real short one with me and Craig today. Only two hours and 12 minutes. It didn't break our personal record. Probably falls into about number three. Uh, and I would say look forward to having you back in a year. But in the world of AI, probably having you back in January or February or as developments happen like that, who knows? And again, privately for my members on maybe more of an investment angle, probably in November. Uh, but I hope all of you enjoyed this. Again, go to at Family Office, my YouTube, which is my more comprehensive, but some unique content on at Family Office TV, both of them. Why not? And look at some of my old interviews with Craig and others that I have if you're newer to my platform. I hope you all had a chance to enjoy this. It was great to have quote unquote Craig back. It's been uh, too long, three or four months. And I hope you enjoyed it for all the reasons that I mentioned earlier and the value of forget my questions, but the answers and thoughts of Craig and that that provides us to think. We may have disagreements. I'm probably a little bit more on the negative side, but I want to be positive. And I think, and I'm getting a little deep now on the, philosophical front and other things we spoke about, but having children, hopefully soon grandchildren, I have skin in the game. I care. These are things that concern me, yet I still believe as a society and as humans, there's so much more that we could do. And our ancestors, what, you know, 250,000 years of, of being homo sapiens, as we believe, and that opportunity moving forward and all that we've overcome. Remember what I said earlier about really, especially only a couple of hundred years ago, how really harsh life was. Very, very harsh. So yes, I could paint a positive picture and I want to be a positive impact, a force moving forward and not always be Mr. Gloomy and so negative. I want to put a little more of a smile on my face, Craig. How about that? 
and look at the optimistic side of things. And again, because I do have skin in the game, this matters to me. Uh, so for those of you out there, uh, whether a family and an entrepreneur, family of wealth, an MFO, and again, I was a little hard maybe on legal <clears throat> accounting, MFOs, and funds, I just want you to be aware there are things you need to be familiar with. There are absolutely in the shorter term ways that you could incorporate this and do amazing things, but many of you aren't. If you go to AngelaRobles.com and reach out to me, hopefully I can help. And absolutely for families of wealth and single family offices, this is a really, really, yeah, a little scary, but a fascinating and intriguing time. So I hope you enjoy some of the unique content that I bring to the table, both digitally and for my members in person. Follow me on my platforms, as I noted, including LinkedIn and X. I'm not quite as active on X, but I'm looking to be more active on there. And again, go to my website, simply my name, angelorobles.com, and especially look into membership and programming and things that I do with my SFO continuity. There is more and more content, including a pretty prominent white paper that you'll notice on my homepage if you scroll down, or I'll go to my membership page. There's a link to it as well. Uh, I shared it with members about a week ago. I decided to open it up more to the public. It really is an inside glimpse to family offices in ways that you haven't seen and heard before. Some of it goes into AI. I don't go too deeply into that. Another white paper I did uh, two or three months ago was deeper into super intelligence and some of the challenges. So hopefully by going to AngeloRobles.com, checking out the white paper, you'll find it or just DM or L or email me and I'll send you a direct link. I decided to open that up more than just my members. I hope you all enjoy it. And it gives you a little bit of a glimpse relative to how I think excellence could be achieved, really not just in the single family office. I think what I wrote applies to others, including the MFO and even funds, legal and accounting to a degree. So why don't you read it? It's free and make your own decision and hopefully your own journey to excellence in terms of what you're doing. Uh, very much appreciated, Dr. Craig Kaplan. Appreciate it greatly. Audience, appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Look forward to the next time and have a great week. Thank you, Craig. Look forward to next time. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. These are great discussions. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you.